Hello, my name is Kyla Ravey. And I'm Dr. Narita Shazal. In our article, we look at the persistent myth of the ideal offender and break down what we see are four common stereotypes of trafficking offending created by representations of trafficking in the media, popular culture, government reports and awareness campaigns. Popular narratives shape how trafficking is defined and understood and how change is envisioned. Critiquing them is therefore crucial in reframing rather than reasserting troubling racial, gender and national stereotypes. The first stereotype that we debunk is that traffickers are exclusively male. Stereotypical constructions of traffickers only as men contradict emerging research into human trafficking, which suggests that women play a key role in human trafficking, not just as victims, but also as offenders. In our article, we look at historical data from Australia and internationally on trafficking convictions, which show the diverse role of female offenders. And we also examine two emerging Australian cases involving allegations of slavery and servitude that depart from stereotypical representations of trafficking. The second stereotype for breakdown is that traffickers are unknown to their victims and the point in which their relationship turns exploitative is immediately upon meeting. Situations of human trafficking involve an element of coercion, fraud, deception or abuse of power to recruit a potential victim. And for these strategies to be effective, traffickers often need to first gain the trust of their potential victim. This can be achieved through establishing connection and a non-exploitative relationship first, and then increasing coercion and control over time. In one of the Australian cases that we examine, the alleged offender and the victim's relationship began as a consensual romantic one. The technique of first establishing trust as a foundation for inactive coercive control often presents in situations of intimate partner violence. This can also be seen in the example of alleged trafficking offending to be a key factor which was then used by the alleged offender to control the victim. The third stereotype that we examine is that traffickers always use physical force to recruit and control victims. Related to the second stereotype, this common narrative ignores the role in which psychological coercion plays in trafficking offending and offending techniques such as social, economic and geographical isolation, which can be employed progressively over time to deliberately control victims. This stereotype exists because it's easier to comprehend slavery achieved through the use of chains and other physical forms of force whereas psychological forms of coercion and control are easier to conceal and therefore also easier to overlook or misunderstand. In both of the Australian cases we examine, techniques of psychological coercion are present, including allegations that offenders used substances to control victims' living, financial and work conditions, and in one alleged offender's own words, using psychological conditioning of women to be 100% dependent on him. It is essential that the role of coercive control is also recognised in all forms of trafficking that, and that further understanding of this is developed and embedded in law, policy and practice to increase individual and institutional capacity to identify and respond to these methods and other forms of psychological harm and control. The final stereotype that we debunk is that traffickers are always foreigners and that trafficking only occurs across international borders. This positioning of trafficking fuels a popular discourse in which the non-citizen is perceived as a criminal threat, which in turn has policy implications that undercut trafficking protections whilst ignoring consideration of the root causes of trafficking and sources of demand for trafficked labour. As seen in one of the cases we examine, which demonstrates how trafficking can be homegrown, the influence of the dominant narrative of trafficking as a foreign issue may have contributed to a delay in identifying situations of exploitation as trafficking in slavery, with local police quoted as saying, it's something that you see that's happening overseas, and that we've been shocked by this, we didn't think this was happening in Australia, let alone Brisbane. Overall, our analysis of the, myths of the, the myth of the ideal offender demonstrates the importance of unpacking, challenging and changing these commonly held stereotypes that dominate the trafficking discourse as they can have dangerous implications. As the case studies we highlight demonstrate, situations that depart from commonly held stereotypes can go unnoticed or unreported. Service providers, police and even victims themselves may not recognise the nature of the harm they witness or experience if it runs counter to commonly perpetuated stereotypes that limit understanding of human traf what tra human trafficking is and how and where it occurs and who perpetuates that and why. 
Critical awareness of how trafficking narratives inform myths and stereotypes is vital in disrupting damaging assumptions, shaping the subjectivities of trafficking and offenders.